Hey everyone, you are listening to another episode of Artist Decoded. This is episode number nine. I just got back from uh, Zion National Park in Utah. And if you've never been to Zion National Park, it's beautiful. I would I would highly advise you to go at least once in your lifetime. And, you know, my time out there was kind of a time for me to refocus and recalibrate to figure out exactly the next step in my plan, you know, for life. And I think sometimes, you know, to work hard, you need to not work so hard. Because if you're always focused on working hard, you might miss the point of what you're working for. And I think sometimes you need that time to refocus and recalibrate and to kind of take a step back and to see the whole picture and to see exactly what you need to do to go forward. But this is my interview with Human. She is a painter and muralist and she's one of my friends. Uh, She was originally from the Bay Area but moved to Los Angeles and now relocated back to the Bay Area. Uh, If you want to take a look at her work, you can find her on Instagram at H-U-E-M-A-N underscore. That's at human underscore. And, uh, you know, we had a chance to uh, to kind of catch up and to talk about different things while she was in L.A. and she was staying at the Ace Hotel. We talked about uh, her solo show at Mirius Gallery in San Francisco and her beginnings growing up in the Bay Area. She's always been drawing ever since she was a little kid and how she got involved with Pow Wow and also her beginnings as a muralist and her fears associated with that. Also, my Instagram handle is at Yoshino Studios if you would like to follow me. And also, I want to remind everyone that we do not have sponsorship right now. So if you feel like it and it would be greatly appreciated if you want to make a donation to us on PayPal, uh, you can either find a link on www.artistdecoded.com or you can email me at info at artistdecoded.com. Music for the podcast is by Deves and Jarrell Perry. Sound engineering is by Andreas Moran. And thank you very much. Here is the episode. I started drawing before I could even remember. So my mom has pictures of me from when I was like one and a half. So I can't remember the first time I picked up a pencil, but I guess she has like photographic evidence, yeah. uh, which is cool. Um, so I've just been doing it since I was a kid. I used to be really into Ninja Turtles. Oh, I used to love Ninja Turtles. Yeah, which Raphael was, your... was my boyfriend. He was really? the rebel. I used to yeah. love Le- uh, Leo, Leonardo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was a Leonardo I could dude. see that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, he has a fucking sword. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. And they were also super easy to try and draw mm-hmm. because I guess you can't really show it over the podcast. But when you're doing the muscles, they're just like curves. That just, oh yeah, it's just yeah. super oh, easy. To, you know, you know what's funny huh. is now that you're talking about it, I remember drawing the Ninja Turtles as a kid. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure yours was much yeah. better than mine, but I remember that specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like ooh, they just they got muscles, so you got to draw it like this. Yeah, yeah. And then when you want to draw the six pack, it's just like a line down the middle, and then you know, two lines across. Yeah. Like you got a Ninja Turtle. It was just super easy. That's hilarious. Um, so yeah, I was really into that and just like stuff like Sailor Moon and just really into cartoons. So um, those were like the first things that I was I was like drawing and inspired by. And I also started playing video games and computer games at a really young age. Yeah. Because my dad is a computer engineer. Oh, so I was always just around computers and Mm -hmm. he would just What, what kind of computer games? Do you remember? Yeah. So, well, I remember the super early ones were like the kid ones. There's like something called Mixed Up Mother Goose and it was on <laughs> it was on DOS and that was like That's the coolest amazing. thing ever. I yeah. remember it was like one of the first games. Yeah. And then my dad also brought home Have you heard of Leisure Suit Larry? No. What it's, is that? It was also like Is that I, like Oregon Trail? No. <laughs> definitely Oregon. not. Leisure Suit Larry. I just remember is that a game. Fucking, it's an adult 
game uh, where you need uh-huh. to like answer a series of questions to even start playing the game because it's age restricted and i was playing it at like seven years old <laughs> okay. and um basically leisure suit larry is this guy who's just a dork and he wears a leisure suit in the 70s you know yeah and the whole point of the game is to get him laid and so you have to like there's a series of challenges like you got to get a condom from like I'm playing what? this at like 7 years old. I don't even know if my dad realized what did it you, was. Did you realize what it was? Yeah, I mean like well cuz there's uh-huh. like girls with their tits out but they were all like pixelated and stuff. Oh. <laughs> but it was That's like the old um Duke Nukem games. Yes. Yeah. Like that kind of. Yeah, yeah, it was like that kind of. I mean, but yeah, it was like sexual. Yeah, yeah. And um but it was funny. It was like a comedy cuz uh-huh. he's like an idiot and a dork and there's no way you can get this guy laid. Uh-huh. And so there's a whole storyline and um yeah, I was like playing that at like 7. That's interesting. So I think that like being exposed to like sexuality like that so early too through games and yeah, finding like my uncle's porn like and it wasn't even porn but it was like pictures of topless chicks and like his garage and stuff oh and, like, yeah so that really like intrigued me like as a kid you know what's funny is i don't think you really see that that much like people that have nude girls on in the garage but yeah. i remember seeing that as a kid it's yeah pe- that was like know. a thing yeah like, that was like a thing yeah. our old uncles and it's just like now it's like a- people keep that shit under wraps yeah you know? it's yeah. all on their phone or whatever right <laughs> or maybe not well because i remember like my like high school <clears throat> ex-boyfriends would like tear out like pages from like maxim or like fhm and it's like this is a hot girl like i'm gonna put her yeah on my wall you know it's basically the same thing Mm -hmm. and being like a little girl and seeing this super sexualized chick with like big tits and it's like wow that really looks interesting and yeah it was and so i think that was what kind of sparked it or the sparked your curiosity it sparked my curiosity about just like because some of my work has sexual undertones too. Not all of it, but like mm. I just did a piece called like Boy Girl Party and it's just... Can you describe it a bit? It's um, it's a wooden piece and it's fragmented, but basically there's just images of guys and girls making out mm-hmm. and then just turns into this abstract thing where it's not even just tongues and lips anymore. It's just like guts and... That's cool. And yeah, and like shiny like... Have, have you released it yet? Oh, is that my it was at my solo show at Miris. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, how, yeah. Did, how did that go? How did the solo show go with at Miris? It was it went really well. It's still yeah. up right now, hoping to sell some more, but yeah. we did well on the first night. Mm-hmm. But it was cool. Uh it was really interesting because the guy so in the building, so Miris is on the third floor. Okay. On the bottom floor is Temple Nightclub. Mm-hmm. And that nightclub has been around for a while. Like the last time I was there was when I was 21 or 22. Oh, I'm wow. about to be 30. Yeah, I feel I feel you. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's, like crazy, right there. it's crazy that it's actually still around. I mean, yeah. because when it you see you nightclubs, back. like they don't usually last more than like five years, you know, because they, mm. they're always changing and there's always something better. But this club has managed to stay around for a long time. So anyway, so the guy who owns the nightclub also owns the gallery. Oh. And um, he, so he owns the whole building. Oh, okay. And he's also an art collector. I think he started the gallery about three years ago. I'm assuming because he ha- he already like was collecting art and I think he decided, you so, know, like yeah. he, he's got a, he's got a really good eye for art and he shows a lot of my favorite artists. Oh, cool. Like Mars One and Damon Soul and Doe's green and stuff and um so what? he's oh i'm sorry go on so he's got really good yeah. taste and so um i think that probably inspired him because he has like space on his third floor of his building that he owns so mm. he can yeah you know so, yeah he, he has a luxury that. to do to do right. that and open up his gallery space yeah and so the interesting thing about it was that during the opening night, mm-hmm. so they actually had like a, <laughs> it was so funny because like the art world and like the nightlife, like nightclub thing, like are just so separate. So separate, yeah. And so after my show, I had like a VIP area. Like we had like two tables and like bottle service. The, wait, in the gallery? No, no, no. Or, downstairs or on in the, the club. second floor on or the, or the first floor? First floor, oh, yeah. Okay. So, like, after the show was done, we all, like, head down to yeah. the duck club. That's very, that's very meta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just really wanted to say that word. Meta. <laughs> I don't know why. 
<laughs> yeah, and we're just all heading down to the club. Yeah. Yeah, and getting bottle service. I was like, this is so funny. Like, yeah. I hella feel like an artist right now. <laughs> like, yeah, like I just had a show. And I were like <laughs> partying with bottles. And That's it hilarious. Was, yeah, and so it was funny. And I think it uh-huh. was actually a really good model, at least for selling work so you've got you've got a nightclub and you've got people you've got your vip patrons and clients Mm -hmm. that are dropping thousands of dollars for bottle service in a night and just imagine like he's like hey do you want to take a private a private tour of my gallery on the third floor and like that's already vip status like oh we get a private tour from the club owner yeah you know what i mean Mm -hmm. Wow, that's smart. Yeah. That's and then really like smart. and it's like if these people have enough disposable income to just drop thousands of dollars on a bottle that would usually cost 35, yeah. you know, like they could probably afford to spend money on, on a art. Piece. Yeah. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so um, Especially when they're intoxicated. Exactly. <laughs> and so uh I ended we up We have Square, you can just use your <laughs> right, credit card to right. purchase this piece. Yeah. So uh, It's only 5 feet by 4 far- feet. <laughs> So as far as like a business model goes, like yeah, he's got it down. He's got it down. Yeah. yeah. Um. So that was what, really cool. What? So what was your? Can you describe your intention behind? I guess that uh, that specific art show. So the theme, the name of it was called Just One Moment. Yep. So Just One Moment. When I think of Just One Moment, I think of 2001: Space Odyssey, where there's that voice Love like that. Just One Moment, please. Like and just just there's always like this it's waiting you know and you're hanging yeah and so i wanted to like dive into that and explore literal moments and very basic moments too where it's just like frozen in time Mm -hmm. stretched to infinity so you know like um astrophysicists talk about how each moment is really repeating to infinity at any given moment Mm -hmm. right and you're encapsulating that in an art piece. Right. So yeah. like if I just took this moment where I'm sitting in front of you and just stretched it out, there's infinite instances of this happening through space. Mm. I wonder so, if that's where deja vu comes from. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to take very basic moments mm-hmm. and just stretch them as if you pressed pause yeah. On a fr- uh, like a frame in a movie and you're able to walk around it like it's in four dimensions. Is that kind of where the geometric structures come into play as well? Yeah, I'll get to that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. so I also envision it like if you saw, I think it was like the last X-Men, like Silver, like the Silver Surfer. Have you seen the last um, X-Men movie? Yeah. Well, or just any movie where um, they like freeze time, but uh-huh. someone is able to walk around and manipulate the different elements that are happening. So like you throw a ball, but someone oh, freezes I know that about. moment. Yeah. And then that, that ball okay. is suspended in the air. And I wanted to create something like that where it feels like you can enter that moment in a physical space, mm. but yet try and convey that on a two-dimensional image. Surface. Surface, yeah. yeah. I've always wanted to do something with this concept, but it wasn't until I watched Interstellar. Oh, Have you seen yeah. Interstellar? Mm. There's that scene where Matthew McConaughey goes through the wormhole, and he's yeah. in like, it's the Tesseract scene, mm-hmm. and he's like, in the fourth dimension wormhole and he's behind the bookcase. Mm-hmm. What's her name? Murphy, right? Uh-huh. He's trying to like communicate with her through the bookcase. But the environment he was in, it was like that moment, but like stretched. And it's like all these different moments ha- that happened in that space alone. Yeah. And I thought it, and it was just so visually stimulating uh-huh. and almost scary. Yeah. And frightening. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, because it's like an unknown space. You don't, right. you have never physically encapsulated that. You've never, so it's kind of stepping into the unknown and also the visualization of that, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. I kind of felt that way. The only, time that i felt kind of what i've seen in inner cellar into the physical form uh-huh. was when i went to the broad uh-huh. kusama's you know yeah the like exhibit infinity, yeah um, the infinity uh, um, room. room yeah yeah i love art that you can experience too yeah. and you can step into it immersive, and kind of yeah immersive mm-hmm. art exactly yeah totally yeah when I saw that scene, uh-huh. it was like, dude, that's exactly what I've been trying to communicate. But mm. because I'm not a filmmaker or, you know, like a motion graphics artist, like yeah. 
I haven't been able to literally like animate it in a way. Yeah. But do movies inspire you a lot of the yeah, times? Yeah, yeah. So what? like I said, like as a kid, even just watching cartoons and mm-hmm. stuff, so many different things inspire me. Um, not just like movies, but things I've read, religion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to get into that. Yeah, so yeah. kind of. You were telling me about Catholicism and kind of your upbringing into Catholicism, and you were you've been to Catholic school uh-huh. since kindergarten. You said, yeah, right? Is I that kindergarten in... through the end of high school? Yep. Until yeah, you went to UCLA. So, yeah. So, so what was that that like? Um, I don't know what it was like for other people, but I mean, I've heard stories of people having a strict Catholic school upbringing, mm-hmm. and um, the schools I went to were like pretty liberal for like Catholics. The high school I went to, we had a gay principal, mm-hmm. gay staff, and we have religion teachers at a Catholic school who most of them aren't even Catholic. Mm. So I was learning about like other religions. Oh, and that's stuff. cool. And so it was it was really interesting. And then I didn't we didn't have to wear uniforms in high school. That's awesome. Yeah, I most think I think Catholic that's Catholic and private schools you have to yeah. wear uniforms. Yeah, yeah. I think which now kind of they steals do. a little bit of your soul. Yeah. <laughs> But I understand where they're coming from with it. But yeah, I think they have uniforms now, though. Oh, I see. Um, Or like a very strict dress code. But back then, like, we could just wear whatever we want. We still had to go to church. You know, like, that was a big part of the whole thing. Yeah. I know know what you mean, because I went to Christian school almost Uh my entire life. Uh So I think it's kind of similar in a way. But I feel like Catholicism is structured a bit more. Yeah. But yeah. it sounds like the school that you went to is really liberal. Yeah, it was super liberal. We There was always like conversations about God. And I mean, because yeah. religion is such a big part of the curriculum. I just remember from an early age realizing or, yeah, learning about what religion was and who Jesus was and, yeah. and the whole history of that. I remember being so confused. Yeah. Because I was like already questioning from a really early age. This doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And I remember being so freaked out because when you're a kid and you start learning things like people die, you know, like, yeah. And then, and the reality of that. The reality of that. I think every kid goes through this thing where they realize that everyone, that they will die and everyone they love they love will die Mm -hmm. every kid goes through this realization where they like freak out for a few days and like oh my god so i remember like telling my mom and i was like i don't want to die i don't want you to die (laughs) you know what's funny is i had a very real experience like that when i was uh so i first started going to christian school Uh uh-huh in first grade okay. and then they kind of fire and brimstone me into do, do you know what that means no. um so in christianity you have to like accept god into your life mm-hmm. and then you can uh go go to heaven essentially mm-hmm. so my first grade teacher basically was like if you don't accept god into your life you're gonna go to hell <gasps> oh. and that's like fire and brimstone yeah. oh right so i was kind of forced into it a bit oh I wow think, in that way interesting emotionally at least yeah did you feel that way at all no so that and that's why i feel like i'm really lucky to have the experience i had because um all throughout school the teachers and and staff were always very mm-hmm. tolerant because we had kids that weren't catholic yeah or even christian and they would come to mass but they didn't have to participate and mm-hmm. then we were always taught like you know they have different customs and they're yeah. not going to participate in this. Did they, did they sit them in the corner? I think, like, I don't remember. You guys can sit in the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was not like they were ever punished or, like, made to feel bad. Yeah. But I, I can imagine it being different at other schools because, like, I hear about, like, my yeah. mom would tell me, like, because she went to Catholic school in the Philippines and, like, the nuns would slap you and you stick to yeah. you and shit. Yeah. And it's super old school, too. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I forgot where I was going. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. I remember. So like I'm, uh-huh. I'm learning like, oh, my God, people die. I will die. You will die. This is scary. And I learned that Jesus – and one of the first things you learn is Jesus died for our sins. Mm-hmm. And then you learn that he died on the cross. And that fucking freaked me out because like he, they put nails in his hands and a crown uh-huh. of thorns. And like when you're six years old and they're like giving you this – graphic violent 
death. imagery death of scene. death. Yeah. Like we're not allowed to watch these things as kids. You can't watch rated R movies, but mm-hmm. yet they're teaching you. <laughs> but watch The Passion of the Christ. Right. Watch The Passion of the <laughs> yeah. Christ. And, Thank you, Mel Gibson. Uh, yeah. And you like describe in detail like how Jesus died. And it's yeah. freaky, you know. So that scared me. And then for some reason, I had this idea that that everyone that's how everyone dies at the end of their life. Hmm. Everyone's put on a cross. That would be interesting. <laughs> so, I would love I would love to be crucified. Uh, I mean, not, not you know, no. when I'm already dead. Right. When I'm already dead yeah. and then it's just kind of this sort of like that's crucifixion. weird. No, no, that's so bizarre. No. I know, that's amazing. Oh, Let's do it. Oh god, no. Yeah. You can uh, crucify me. I'll already be dead. I've it's seen okay. Some fucked up stuff. Have you thought about how you would want to be um with, Oh, I want to be <laughs> cremated. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the way I'd want to. Um, I I've do heard it, about people <laughs> getting cremated and then their ashes put into paint. Oh. And then, and then someone. Yeah. I would want canthus? like some dope artist to like paint with Who would me. you want? Ooh. Huh. Let's pick three to make your portrait out of your ashes. Oh, I don't know. Don't make me answer this question. There's like so many. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there any one person that comes to mind? Not really. No. No. Okay. I have so many favorite artists, but then what are your, it's just what are your, like what are your favorites? A couple of them. My favorite artists, um, James Jean. Okay. Um, I already mentioned him already, but like Mars One, and if you want to talk like old school, um, Francis Bacon. I love Francis Bacon. Yeah. Um, it's probably one of my favorites. One of my favorite illustrators. Floyd. Yeah. One of my favorite illustrators is Aubrey Beardsley and Alphonse Mucha. The whole Art Nouveau. I love Salvador Dali mm-hmm. and. Renee Magritte, like all the surrealists and stuff. Yeah. There's just so many. There's just so many. There's so much and then good I'm, I'm, content and out there. Yeah. And then in the last like 10 years, I've been really into like some of the really cool contemporary like installation art. Like I like saw James... a really cool one at, at LACMA. Which one? The Pierre Hugh, the one uh-huh. with the uh, a white albino painted pink dog that was walking around in oh, the video ex- uh, exhibit of that dog. Um, that's just walking around in the space. It's an actual living dog. And then on the outside of the exhibit, through the glass door, there's uh, this sculpture uh-huh. with, that has a beehive on it. Do you know oh, what I'm talking no. about? It's probably one of the cooler Okay, um, I got to look that up. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. At, it was at LACMA. It's not anymore. Mm-hmm. I think that ended in February. Okay. It was very, it was memorable. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got to check that out. Uh, the LACMA, like, this was back in, I want to say like 2006 or seven uh-huh. but they had an amazing exhibit called ecstasy did you were you around for that no i, I moved to la in 2006 actually but oh, okay i i was so back then i was just so um skate culture like you know mm-hmm. i wasn't really influenced by art and i just started to mm-hmm. pick up a camera at the end of 2006 okay. and but, even when i picked up the camera i wasn't artistic at right, all right you know yeah well the, well we were talking about art being accessible and stuff Mm -hmm. and um so this LACMA exhibit was called ecstasy it had some pretty good mainstream appeal oh I see because it was it was basically the whole exhibit was about creating the illusion of being under drugs Mm. or like it was about being on drugs well so it was a whole exhibit at the at the was the Geffen contemporary that's mocha right that Mm -hmm. one by um little Tokyo yep yeah so it was all in there. So it was this huge exhibit. So there's like different like installations and art. Mm-hmm. So they had an LSD fountain. But then they also had... Was these- there LSD in it? Yes. What? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? There's LSD like in the water. So then can you go over and touch it? And, like, yeah, I don't fingers? think you can like touch it or something. <laughs> I don't know. I forgot. I forgot what it even looked like. But okay. I remember that was like one of the big things in there. But then they had all these really cool installations. And that's when I first learned about James Terrell. Oh, and um, because he did a really big one where James it was this huge room, and I just love what he does with light. Mm -hmm. But you, the edges of the room are rounded, you know, like what are those called? Yeah, psych. psych. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, but it was lit, so you couldn't tell where the room ended. Oh. So you and it's all the lights were really dim and soft and pink, I believe. And then you walk in, and you, I was walking really carefully to the other side because that's how you exit. Okay. But you don't know like how far it is. Yeah. I mean, you can only tell with the scale of like the other people on the other end. Yeah. Where yeah. are you from originally? The East Bay. Oh, okay. So I um I grew up around Hayward and Fremont. Yeah. I grew up from uh, San Jose. 
uh, what was life like uh, in the South Bay, or I mean, in the in the Bay Area? Amazing. Or, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> life is life is so amazing. <laughs> not uh, not really. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It was super towny because I was in I lived in Fremont, but I went to school in Hayward. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize until after I left Hayward that where I went to school was kind of ghetto. <laughs> it was yeah, actually that really was your reality. ghetto. It was my reality, yeah. you know? Like, um, there was one school that had a daycare for kids, for these <laughs> kids that were having kids. Okay. <laughs> so, like, there's a line of girls, like, pushing baby strollers waiting to get on the school bus. That's crazy. It was nuts. Yeah. And, um... I don't know. It's just like weird shit like that that we yeah. were just around because we were. I know. What you, I know. What in you Hayward, mean, though. you know what I mean. Like, yeah. and so we didn't know that it was. I don't even want to say was, ghetto because it's not ghetto, but it's just lower income. Mm-hmm. So things were a little bit rougher. Yeah. Uh, and then it wasn't until I left and went to UCLA, and because once I left for LA, like I was just learning about so many different types of people and mm-hmm. cultures and. You know, when you go off to college, like that does that to you. And so when I came back, I was like, damn, it's kind of rough around here. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, I come from like a like middle class family mm-hmm. and it's, it's just super normal. Well, wh- why did you go to UCLA in the first place? Was it for art specifically? It was for design. So it's more digital based Mm -hmm. so um and it's a very so the design media arts major is a very like broad basically just has to do with digital art so if someone wants to go into advertising or graphic design or motion graphics or anything um that has to do with design in a digital sense Mm -hmm. then they can go to the design program at ucla but the difference it's a you know it's a four-year university um yeah and it's not like going to art school where you have your like you're an illustration major, you're a motion graphics major, and it's it's not very specific. Yeah. And so a lot of it was just based on um, theory and like the, a lot of the learning just came from critiques. Mm-hmm. So we were doing all these different projects and um, they never actually taught you how to use any of the software or anything. A lot of it was just doing projects and then. I don't know, critiquing yeah. each other. Yeah. Yeah. I see. yeah. Did, did you, so did you finish with that major? Yeah. Do you think you'll ever uh, revisit digital art in your artwork? Oh, yeah. Or have you, have you revisited that? Yeah. Well, so I, I, I've been mocking my stuff up digitally. Yeah. Cause it's just easier uh-huh. that way. But I don't think I'm ever going to do just a fully digital thing. Uh-huh. Um, because I don't know. I just, for a long time, I thought that graphic design and web design was like the thing I wanted to pursue or I thought I wanted to do like did you pursue it I did I was doing it for about seven or eight years so I did it all throughout college that was basically my job so I was just self-employed freelancing as a web designer Mm -hmm. graphic designer and then senior year of college for one of my independent study courses you literally can just do anything you want (laughs) yeah Uh so i decided i wanted to create a mock design studio agency oh i ended up turning it into a real thing because like i had all the branding i was like dude i could totally do this did you have people under under you so yeah that was the plan Mm -hmm. so i i did have um people that were freelancing for me so i was working with designers and like programmers and i was doing that for a while it just I don't know. I but hated fell it. Apart? Oh. No, not fell apart. So it was that I was actually it just doing felt really like a job? well. Yeah. So it felt like a job because as a kid, like I started I started messing around with web design at like eleven years old. So because I said like my dad is a computer dude, so I was yeah. already like really exposed. So you come from a pretty technological Yeah. Background. I mean Fremont is, you know a tech capital. Yeah. yeah. I mean a lot Along of the people the who Valley. work in Silicon Valley, like there's a lot of people that live in Fremont, mm-hmm. um, including my dad. And so I was around that a lot. So I was I was really into um web design and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, I so I was actually doing really well and I was getting all these clients and stuff. Mm-hmm. When I was eleven, like I was so excited about creating stuff using code, creating graphics and Photoshop. And it was fun. But once I was like making it my living, it wasn't wasn't fun fun anymore. And I thought, and I always had this idea that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh 
So I wanted to be this like boss lady that yeah. had like a studio and whatever. So that was which my is whole... what you are now, pretty much in a different way. In a different way, because back then it was well, like you, I, I want to. I mean, but you found your own yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought like I'm gonna run a design studio and have all these clients and like yeah. a whole team. And um, I realized I didn't want to be that kind of boss. I don't want to have. When to... did you realize that? Do you remember the year? Uh, 2010. Oh, okay. Yeah, 2010. And then did you just dissolve the agency? Yeah, because I there was just a lot going on at the time, and and I guess this goes into the story of how I became human. We were talking about that. Earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was doing really well. I was getting all these clients, but then it became more than I was able to like handle. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think I'm cut out to run a whole team of designers yeah you just want to do your own thing yeah and on top of that so in 2010 like i think i made three paintings total Mm -hmm. and i didn't realize how depressed i was for just not making art yeah i'd be so i'd be working on these websites and logos and random shit all day and then i would see my favorite artist making art yeah and and it just puts you in the yeah and i'm like yeah and i'm just like i could be doing that i want to do that Mm -hmm. but i also grew up thinking who makes a living being an artist yeah. You know what I mean? It is a, it is a, a harder living. It is. Uh-huh. And you hear about the stereotypes of the starving artist. So then when was that decision? Like, where, where were you like, I need to create art. This is what I want to do. I'm going to dissolve this agency and then move to creating specifically art. Do you remember I, that? Um, yeah. Yeah. The straw <laughs> that broke the camel's back. Yeah. This chick, she was a terrible client terrible terrible client mm-hmm. and um i so i had i had to tell her like well we can't work together anymore and long story short she tried to she tr- like she tried to get a non-refundable deposit back mm-hmm. and made it very difficult for me and it, i mean it wasn't really a lot of money but it was enough to make me stressed out with all that i already had on my shoulders yeah and i was like i don't want to have to deal with bullshit like this mm-hmm. when I know this isn't what I want to do deep down because maybe if this was what I wanted to do deep down, I'd be able to fight and whatever. But I just want to make art all day. And the chick that I had working for me was terrible. I don't know. Everything was terrible. My relationship that I was in was terrible. Uh My living situation was terrible. Everything was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) I fucking... And it was really hard. Like around that time, I was crying on the phone to my mom like, at least once a week. Really? Yeah. It was bad. I was really depressed. And then you just started creating? Yeah. I just, when that whole thing happened, I was like, this can't be life. <laughs> this can't be my life. Yeah. I'm still really young because 2010. So I was like 25, 24. Yep. I'm like, I'm still young. You yeah. Know? Yeah, you, I'm like, yeah. You are. I don't want to have to deal with this if this isn't what I really want to do. Mm hmm. And it was just so stressful. And so I fired the chick that was working for me. I got rid of all my bad clients, finished the other projects to completion, yep. then just started to close that up. Yeah. And then I started to get rid of like the bad friends. Yeah. And then eventually it was got a very rid conscious of, decision. Yeah. And then eventually got rid of that relationship that I was in. Yeah. Taking all the toxic things out of your yeah, life. Yeah. Taking out all the toxic things. And that's when I realized... I want to be doing art. Like, that's what I know will make me happy. That's the one constant in my life mm-hmm. that's always been there. Yep. Um, through all the different friends and situations I've been in, art has always been like, number one to me. Then how was it starting out? What do you mean? How is it starting out when you came to that realization and then you started pursuing art? I'm sure it was a very revitalizing time. Yeah. But at the well, same time. Well, I still time, had to how, make money. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. How, how did, I guess, how so, did you make money during that time? Um, luckily, I'm good at networking <laughs> and I'm and I'm good at selling myself. And so I was able to get clients such as Disney. And um, so I was doing like part time work for them, mm-hmm. contract work, doing like illustrations and stuff. Yeah. So there were that, I mean, that was like paying the bills for a while. Mm-hmm. And then, um, or I would take like odd graphic design projects here and there. So it's yeah. not like it was totally. Scouring Craigslist. Yeah. Sometimes. That's <laughs> yeah. when it got really bad though. Like you don't ever want to have to resort to Craigslist. Well, I know what you mean. Cause yeah. I mean, during that time when I was right. kind of beginning photography yeah. or, yeah. you know, beginning my you career in photography. Somewhere. Yeah. 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 And, and it's so- funny because 
another one of my guests, Isaac Bauman. He's a cinematographer, uh -huh. and he's a very prolific cinematographer. Mm -hmm. um, he's done like 80 m music videos and commercials and awesome. stuff. But he was saying the same thing, you know, during that time. He's mm -hmm. relatively the same age that he was like scouring Craigslist yeah. to find work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Craigslist yeah. is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it can be, and it's so yeah. weird. It's so fucking weird. Oh, sometimes, yeah. I've too. met some of the worst people ever in life on Craigslist, yeah. too. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's Craigslist is crazy. Yeah. But, so um, then where was that tipping point for you? It's weird because it was a very gradual thing. The tipping point, I mean, I would say it was that chick trying to like get her money back yeah. from me. And nope. then on top of that, I ended up having to sue someone like a few months later. It was just craziness. Yeah. So well, it was 2010 and 2011 were two very, very hard volatile years. Volatile years. Yeah, volatile yeah. as fuck. But I mean, where was that tipping point to where your art started becoming really successful? I don't know because it's been a gradual Constant. thing because I started showing my art in 2004. So I was 18 mm -hmm. and I've been growing just my art since then. Like I would pursue it on the side yeah. while I was doing the web design stuff. Um, I was still showing in galleries, but um, it wasn't until, oh, I know. Yeah. Hold on. I know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and now so, I recall. And now I recall. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So I mentioned like working for different companies like Disney and uh -huh. whatever, doing a bunch of commercial work. I ended up getting a part-time position at Playboy TV. Okay. Um, in Burbank. So I was just doing graphic design and it was, it was an awesome position. Like I loved working there and the team was amazing. And yeah. this was the very first like office job I had where I had to come into an office because mind you, I was self-employed this entire time yep. and I've never had like an actual real job. So when I was working there, I was beginning to think, wow, this could actually be really cool. Like, cause I found a team that I really like working for. Cause I always just assumed I was bad working <laughs> in teams cause yeah. I've been self-employed for so long and I'm so independent. Like yeah. I always I think it's a very my... millennial thing. Yeah, it is. It reason. is. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, we're just spoiled brats. Yeah, we are. We're so spoiled <laughs> we want... and so entitled. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, I'm going to and... do this on my yeah. own. And yeah. And so, and I just always thought like, I can't get along with other people and, but this is the first time that I felt like I fit in mm -hmm. um, with a team and I really enjoyed my job. Um, we were doing marketing for Playboy TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they, and then my boss was talking about it because it was like permalance. So I was freelancing, yep. but it was supposed to turn into a permanent position. Mm -hmm. And there was a um, possibility for me to like grow with mm -hmm. the company. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, wow, this is actually something – I could see myself doing for a while, you know? And so now like these thoughts of being an artist started to kind of fade away. I mean, not fade, but like, yeah. Cause I'm, as I'm getting older, I'm like, I got to do something stable though. When, I need, when was that? What do you remember the like year? 2012 or 2012. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just um, retracing your timeline. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My timeline, I, it's all over the place. No, but, it's cool. uh, so anyway, like, did I know you when I did my ritual project? Yeah. Yeah. Over Think Tank? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was starting to work on Ritual while I, I got to skate on that, that, um, yeah. That, yeah, 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 that yeah. ramp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. Okay. So I was starting to do my Ritual project while I was still at Playboy. Uh huh. Yeah. So I was doing that. And I remember I was, I was painting because I would only come into the office like three times a week. Yeah. And, um, the other two days I was able to either like work from my studio or, yeah. You know, work from home or something because they were really flexible too like it was really the perfect like work situation cool so i'm in think tank literally painting on the walls and my show is about to open in like two days and i get a phone call and it's from my boss and the hr rep and they're like hey we're letting you go we're yeah. actually letting the whole team go so they got rid of our entire team and so <laughs> i'm just like oh Okay. <laughs> and like I hang Was up the phone uh -huh. and I have like I have my phone in one hand, I have a spray can in the other because I was literally painting my murals in the gallery while this was happening. And so I'm just like, well shit. I guess now is the time to to pursue. fully pursue. Yeah. Art. And so I that kind of just threw me in. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. And then I just never looked back. So after ritual, like that ended up being really big for me. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, because Think Tank's huge. Yeah. How, how big is it? 
Do you remember it's like how five thousand many... square feet? Well, all together. Yeah. But I don't know how much, how big, like the the space I was painting was. Hmm. But it's a really big space, and it got a lot of attention. And it was the first time I was in LA Weekly, and after that, like more opportunities started to show up. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's what it's been. Mm-hmm. And has social since... media helped with that? Your yeah. Instagram and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. To gain relevancy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've always been like big on social media stuff. Yeah, yeah. I just know how to. Yeah, it's like... a great tool. Yeah, it really is, especially for artists, because mm-hmm. you know it's like a visual medium. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's really good for artists, and yeah. So, so when did when did Pow Wow uh, come about? Oh, the Pow Wow, collaborating with them. Oh my God, I've wanted to I've wanted to paint with them for like the last like few years. Yeah. Uh, what is Pow Wow? So Pow Wow is know. a mural festival. They became really big when they started doing Pow Hawaii, but I believe it started in like Hong Kong by Jasper Wong. And every mm. year in Hawaii, they um, for a week they or like a week or two, they bring out artists from around the world mm-hmm. to paint all over um, Kaka'ako, which is um, an area in. Uh, um, in Oahu. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's just like artists painting murals for the entire week, and there's like a bunch of events that happen at the same time, like parties and like art shows, and that's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then there's like a th- street festival, and um, it's gotten so big. Um, the brand Pow Wow has gotten so big over the last few years, so they've mm-hmm. taken it to Taiwan. They're going to Taiwan and Japan, uh, the coming in the coming month. They did it in Long Beach recently. Yeah. Um, How was I, that? It was cool. It was really cool. Um, it was really a trip for me because a lot of the artists that participate in Pow Wow, I've been fans of for a while. So it was really cool to be able to just like paint with them and hang out with them. Mm-hmm. And do you get to collaborate um, with anyone that you? Yeah, yeah. So admire? in Long Beach, I collaborated with Mad Steez, and he's dope. He's a character, as most artists are. Yeah, yeah. He's really <sighs> cool, and um, he has his own magazine called Bliss Magazine. Oh yeah, I don't know if you've heard yeah, of it. No, yeah, no, I have heard of it. Yeah, yeah. So he's a uh, he's awesome. And it's just cool like when you collaborate with artists, you end up like taking some things cuz I don't they act as mentors essentially. Yeah, yeah. You and see I the still, way that like, they do I'm things. I'm still relatively like young in the game and he's been around for a while and so when we were working together, I'm just like seeing how he's doing things and I don't I wasn't usually projecting my murals, but like he's got this process where he like outlines everything. And so I started doing that and I'm like, wow, this like makes it a lot easier, yeah. you know. And so like you just learn things from other people and yeah. pick up on them and constantly bettering yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was cool. Yeah. It was just cool being around people you admire and yeah. stuff. And I remember like so uh, Fafi. She are you familiar with Fafi? No, I'm not. So she she's a she's a an bit. artist. She's a street artist from um, France. She's big for a lot of girls because I mean she's a female street artist and is she one of the bigger ones? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember I became a huge fan of her around the time where she did like a collaboration with Mac Cosmetics. Oh, okay. And I think that was in like 2006. So it was cool. So it was like. I, I was kind of fangirling when I like met her and then over yeah. over the course of the week now we're just like partying together and I'm like this is so cool like, so like part of me is just like trying to keep it cool around like all my yeah, favorite you're like, artists yeah, yeah. Like, yeah like yeah I'm, I'm like you but inside I'm just like oh my god oh my yeah. god I'm not like you at I'm all I'm not like you like, you guys are so you just awesome. want to bow down yeah. the whole time <laughs> I think it's a good yeah, feeling to yeah. to feel that way because it kind of brings you back to your childlike sensibilities right, and playfulness right. and mm-hmm. being able to take your ego out of the picture and just really yeah. admire someone for what they do. Yeah. A lot of artists have big egos, but yeah, in this scene in particular- A lot of people whole, in general have big A lot egos. of people in general, but with like powwow, yeah, getting back to powwow, I think they also pick people that they like working with. Which is really how it goes with most places. Like most companies, they'll they'll work with you if they know they like you. Yeah. You know, like mm-hmm. if there's two people that are equally as talented, they're going to pick the one who's not an asshole. So for the most part, like the people at Pow Wow, and I say for the most part because I, I haven't met everyone yeah. that's participated, but everyone's really cool and it's it's got this like family vibe. And so when we were in Hawaii, it felt like summer camp. Um, because it's like all these, <laughs> That's cool. yeah, all these artists are out in Hawaii painting 
and just hanging out at the end of the day and we're just talking. We're like, oh, so how's your mural going? Oh, mine's cool. Yeah. Let's get some drinks. So it was like an adult summer camp. It was, it was so awesome. So when, when, when did you um, decide that you wanted to do street art? Because that's such a much, that's such a larger scale yeah. than than anything that you were doing I've wanted to do it past. since I was a kid. Mm. I've loved graffiti since I was a kid. I'm not so much into graffiti now, but I do love, I mean, graffiti has evolved so much, you know? Mm -hmm. But I just remember seeing like tags and throw ups on the freeway and like just growing up in the Bay, like seeing yeah. just all that stuff around, you know? Maybe that takes you back into your past growing up in kind yeah, of like a yeah. maybe a rougher neighborhood. Oh, bit, well, it wasn't even just there, that. but it was like all over the Bay, you know, being in yeah. San Francisco, being yeah. in Oakland, and it was just everywhere. And I always wanted, to, like I wanted a part of that, but I was it's just so intimidating. Like, what do you do with a spray can? Mm -hmm. You know, like how do you even begin to paint with a spray can? How did how did you begin to learn how to? Um, I just, just started. <laughs> yeah. I just Is that decided... how you usually approach projects? You just start and see and what comes up? And figure it out. Yeah, like yeah. I was trying to French braid this morning by oh, like yeah. looking up YouTube. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, so, okay, it's a funny story because I actually wanted to start way before I did. So when MySpace was still big, I... Um, <laughs> MySpace. Yeah. I put up like a post or a, I think it was like a bulletin or something. And I said, where can I get spray caps? Because, like, when you interchange spray caps, you can get, like, a fatter spray or a skinnier spray or whatever. Mm. So I wanted to play around and just, like, teach myself. And I got responses that were like, oh, that's cute. You're going to go bomb a wall? <laughs> and it was, like, so condescending. Yeah. And at that time, I wasn't as confident as I am now. I was a little more insecure. So I was just like, oh, yeah, okay. maybe you shouldn't do that. Yeah. And thinking. that actually kept me from doing it for a while because it was like, When oh. was that? Do you remember? Like 2006, seven? Uh, yeah, maybe around that yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, MySpace days. Yeah, MySpace days. <laughs> yeah, you know, MySpace yeah, days. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so <laughs> I was just like, well, fuck, now I don't want to do it. Now that people are talking to me, like, oh, that's cute, little girl. You're going to go paint a wall. Yeah. You know? But also, I feel like being that would empower you to want to do it even more. Yeah, I think it, I had maybe to not get. At that time. I had to get to that breaking point in 2010 later where I, like, Cause that's how it happened. Like after I like got rid of all my clients and all this shit, I just felt like I had nothing more to lose. Cause I, like I said, everything was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> hated my relationship, hated a bunch of my friends, hated my career. Yeah. And so as I was like starting to purge, I was just like, well, I have nothing to lose. I might as well just start painting walls. Cause who, who gives a fuck? Cause I was, I was, that was my attitude around that time was who yeah. gives a fuck. Did you do a legal wall or did you do a, I did a legal, legal wall. wall. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not about to tell you what I've done illegally. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 You don't, you don't have to talk yeah, about yeah. that. But, um, yeah. Where I was did... the first, where, where was that piece at? Is it still up? No, it's not. It was, it was in a uh, little Tokyo. Hmm. Yeah. Or wait, actually, no, it was in my studio. Cause um I cause I still had like studio space so I was like playing around in my studio walls and stuff, and then as I'm like getting better, I'm realizing damn this is like I can be really good at this. And when I first did like my first wall outside, like something clicked and I was just like oh shit this is what I need to be doing because I wasn't behind did my you just computer. You get super passionate about it. Yeah, yeah because like I wasn't behind my computer. Mm -hmm. I was able to collaborate with other people. And I'm a social person. Like, I don't want to be behind my computer for 14 hours a day, yeah. you know? And um, I was in the sun. I was using my whole body. Yeah. And so, I, and here's that thing. Like, I felt human. Is that where the name came from? That's exactly where the name came from. Oh. Because all this buildup. Anxiety. And, and anxiety and stuff, it just... It like it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulders, mm -hmm. you know. But I think you dealt with it in a really healthy way. Yeah. 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 And kind of releasing all of that and turning it into right. who you are now. Because like I said, art was always a constant, you know. That was like the one thing I could rely on. Yeah. And so I mean, and it, and it wasn't, and it's not like I went into it like, oh, I need therapy. I'm going to have some spray paint therapy. Well, that essentially but, was you your know, therapy. But it was, it was. And without knowing it at the time, it just felt like it just clicked, you know? Yeah. And so when I find something good, I'm going to keep chasing it. Uh -huh. and so what's, what's the next thing? Do you, do you know the next thing that you want to do? Um, 
I guess it's kind of hard to like project yeah, into the future I mean, a bit. It's just because it's all so organic. You mm-hmm. know, there's a few things I'm working on that I don't really want to like talk about right now. Yeah. Because it's so super early. Yeah. But. And it seems like if you talk on, like, about them, you have to. Yeah. You yeah. have to pursue it. And, yeah. And you, you might not know right. exactly if you want to pursue but, it. But um, I know I am going to be doing ritual again next year. Oh, cool. In I Detroit. Think so. Oh, oh, in Detroit. In Detroit, most likely. That and that's gonna be interesting because now I like actually know how to paint. <laughs> I mean, the ritual <laughs> stuff, mean? like I well, ritual. I was still like figuring out my like my style and. Um, well, I don't think that ever ends. That's part of the journey. You're constantly figuring out. Yeah, yeah, to... but I mean, I was so new to spray paint around oh, ritual. Yeah, okay. And now it's like I have a lot of experience under my belt, and now it's more about like concept. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm I'm excited about that. So ritual is going to be one thing, and I want to make ritual like an ongoing project, like once a year, once every other year. Cool. Because um, the thing that I loved about ritual, which can you describe what ritual is to sure. people that don't know? Yeah, ritual is a project I did in 2013, where for a month I was following different creatives. So I was following an actor, a dancer, um, other other artists. Jarrell, like you know, musicians yeah. and all that sort of thing, and I was, I was really interested in their creative rituals. Mm. So I really liked seeing their studio spaces where they created their work, how they got into the mode of creating work, and that was always just really interesting to me because everyone is just so different. I followed Brandon; he goes by Monk, and he was the one who oh, built okay. the wooden. Yeah. the wooden pyramid thing at Ritual. Yeah. It was really interesting to see him work because when he starts work, he takes all the tools he needs and like arranges it in a certain way. I forgot there's like a name for it, but mm. he tries to do it as quickly as he can mm-hmm. and arranges it out in front of him in this like really interesting way. Interesting. Like, have you seen those? Like, uh, I mean, it got big on like Instagram and like different fashion sites, but uh-huh. you've, you've got like your um, your outfit laid out in a really cool way. So you got your sunglasses here and your t-shirt and your shoes. And Oh, I see. So yeah, there's a name for that. Like, like when set you're... design? Or not set design, but um, it's desi- like product Yeah, yeah. Design, but there's an actual like word for setting all your all the product up like that. Okay. I, so it started uh-huh. as this method. So that's what he would do. He would like take his brushes, his ruler, his whatever, and then arrange it on like a table in front of him as quickly as he could. It was yeah, and, huh, and it that was like is that, meditative is that his for him. beginning process before he starts. Yeah, work? so he gets all his tools together, oh, but that's how he, and he arranges it in front of him in this really like cool way. Or like so, did you start here. doing like, that? Um, I've tried to a yeah. few times, but yeah, so I would see these things that other people were doing, and I try to like yeah. pick up on certain things. Oh, and, I see. Yeah. So do you so, have your own creative rituals? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Everyday rituals, maybe. What, Everyday what, what rituals. Are those? I try to wake up at like 6 30 or 7 every morning yeah i do that too yeah and mm-hmm. i like to like run in the morning and get all that all the fitness stuff out of the way me too before the day starts yeah and then um and then i get to my studio around like nine like nine or nine thirty or ten and i try to have a normal work day i try to go home by like six or seven Mm -hmm. especially because my fiance has like a regular job yeah so like i like to make my schedule yeah around the same time as his so that i can come home and we can like have dinner together and um yeah because you know because like as an artist you can show up at any time and then you're working until four in the morning you know and it just do you ever do you ever find yourself doing that sometimes though when when it's um crunch time when it's crunch time but I don't like making that a thing. I'm yeah. not a night owl. I yeah. can't like I get Me a lot too. of I get a lot of yeah. energy from like daytime and like uh-huh. or even early morning. Like I like doing stuff early in the morning while everyone's still sleeping. But I can't And then you feel accomplished. Yeah, then I feel accomplished. Yeah. I'm like, oh I got all this stuff done before like nine AM, you know. But, I'm, the, um, I'm the same way. I like to do that as well. Yeah, yeah. I wake up generally like six thirty or or seven and yeah. I go and work out. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh make the bed. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Cause then Which it also sounds makes so me... weird, but making the bed actually kind of puts you in this state where you're like, my you day has started. Fi- yeah. My day has started. Yeah. I finished this activity and right. now I can accomplish another yeah. activity. Yeah. And it's very, um, totally. you know, yeah. regimented. Exactly. I guess. 
because I I did try and have like my studio at home years ago mm-hmm. and that didn't work out because <laughs> then I'd be in my pajamas until 4 p.m. and then I'm like oh I haven't even started yeah. my day you like haven't even brushed your teeth yeah yeah <laughs> you it's haven't eaten gross. breakfast yeah, yeah. and they're, like it's so important for me to like get my day started mm-hmm. I've done it for long enough now where is you balance know, really important to you yeah it's so important because it also I, seems that way in your artwork too because you have this sort of balance between abstract yeah. and figurative mm-hmm. and um, kind of like geometric and organic mm-hmm. and things like that. So yeah, yeah. How, how does balance play into your life, I guess? And well, yeah, I feel like you have to have certain things that are set, certain things that are balanced so that you can afford to do all the spontaneous stuff, you know, mm. the spo- so you can work the spontaneous stuff around it. So like if I am, if I don't have anything really planned for my studio for the day, at least I know that I'm working out in the morning and then the rest of the day I have to like decide. Exactly. You know? So like that's why I like. Instead I like, of thinking about, oh shit, I need to work out. Yeah, exactly. Fuck, I need to work out. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like 4 p.m. <laughs> and you're like, oh man, I gotta yeah, work out yeah. tonight. You're right. And you just don't end up working yeah, out. Yeah, working out like gives me structure because that's the one thing that, that I wanna... can count on, you know, yeah. because like everything else can get like thrown out of place or, mm-hmm. you know, or a project might come up at the last minute and but it's like, oh, but I can look forward to this. Yeah. And that'll set the rest of my day. Yeah, that's like why I like time. lifting weights in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, and like running a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So um so yeah, so with the art thing, it's it's the same in a way. Well, yeah, it's it's the same. Um so I work spontaneously. I throw around paint really spontaneously or like I'll mess around with a can or like splatter paint with a brush and I'll make this really abstract piece. Yeah. And it's almost like a conversation with myself because like I'll let it dry and then I'll step back and I'll look at it. And sometimes I'll find like in the weird little forms, I'll find like a face mm. or like a mouth mm-hmm. or even just like the silhouette of someone's body. And then when, like it's Is like, it kind of like when you look at a popcorn ceiling a bit? Exactly. A popcorn ceiling or a stain on the wall. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you just see that. It's kind yeah. of like seeing Jesus in your toes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Popcorn You're like, ceiling. my art is like Jesus in your toes. <laughs> yeah. And popcorn ceilings. Yes. Or like <laughs> That should clouds. be in your bio. I made that. Do you ever see uh, paintings and you create something you're like, wow, this is not what I expected and you just toss it? Or do you generally um, keep all of your no, paintings? No. So I'll wait. So, okay. So going back to my process, like I'll let it dry and then I come back and I'm like, oh, this looks like this or this looks like that, you know? And then I'll, I'll try to pull it out and I'll literally carve that image, mm-hmm. you know, out of my painting. Like if I, for my, I had a piece, I mean, I, this is, I did this for all of my pieces in the show. Mm-hmm. At the most recent one? Yeah. Well, I do it mostly for all of my like canvas works that aren't client yep. based mm-hmm. and stuff. But one of the pieces I was working on, I did the whole splatter thing. I could not get the image of this monkey squatting behind a person and snapping their neck. (laughs) That's amazing. And usually I don't see anything that aggressive. But I'm like, why? Like, I can't get that image out of my head. Wait, did you do that in one of the pieces? No. No, I didn't. But like... It's like also it's also like a Rorschach ink blot where you're like, what do you see in this ink blot? Ooh, I see my mother yelling at me, or you mm, know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or like I see a butterfly, or and then supposedly that's supposed to like say something about the way we think yeah. or something. And huh. so I mean, you know, so I kind of I kind of see where that was going. Mm-hmm. And that's what you use. So sometimes what I see is influenced by the way I feel. Mm-hmm. And that's why I feel like it's a conversation with myself. Oh, I see. And yeah. that's why you keep on going back to And so I go back piece. and forth with it. Oh, so I see. So I'm like, oh, it looks like this. And then I'll work on it. And then I just always step back because I don't really ever start with a sketch. Um, it's it's very organic the way I like come up oh. with everything. I also like all my work to be somewhere in the in-between. Like I like it to be ethereal. And I like it to be aggressive but in a different way. Mm-hmm. Like – well, I aggressive think the, the in a col- very soft way. Yeah. So I, think I like the choice of color that you yeah. use, though, makes it soft. But yeah. at the same time, you have these sort of geometric lines right. that kind of will cut up the figure exactly. a bit. Exactly. Yeah. So, and so the you lines, juxtapose those things. Yeah. So the lines come at the end most of the time. And those are really just for 
aesthetic. lot of it's for aesthetic. But uh, but then a part of it is also breaking up, like I said, breaking apart a moment and repeating certain elements. And like, mm-hmm. I, I like that whole fragmented look. Fragmented um, reality. Fragmented reality. But it started off being just aesthetic because... Like I said, everything was very organic. I'm just throwing shit around. Yeah. And I brought in the lines and the shapes to anchor everything down, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Because it felt too soft. So I wanted to... And I think that's my designer's eye. Yeah. Um, I wanted... That's cool. I would see this like cloudy shape and it just seemed too cloudy. So I'm like, well, it needs something here. Let me just put in a solid triangle. and mm-hmm. And so I'm just going back and forth, like adding elements until it it's feels just right. right exactly so a lot of people think it's really planned out because it looks like that yeah but really i mean all those shapes and lines come at the very end and i'm just working it until it looks like something that was planned yeah yeah do you paint certain faces and or certain people that you know no or well or how do you find how do you find i did that? use i did use one person i know you know yuna you oh, know Yuna. Yeah, yeah. I shot Yuna. Yeah, yeah. Back, you were telling me day. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I painted her for one of my pieces, but it was just random. You so just saw I, her face I, in it? No, 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 no. So I, I'll see these faces and then I'll either take reference pictures so that it matches what I see. Mm-hmm. So if I see like a three-fourths profile of a girl, then I'm going to look for something online or shoot something Oh, cool. That matches that, and then I'll use that as a reference image. Mm. So I had this one piece where it totally looked like a chick who's wearing like a head, like a head wrap. So I went on, I went online, and I googled <laughs> woman with head wrap, <laughs> and I just like tried to, just so I can get yeah. the basic like structure. Uh huh. And she kept coming up, you really? know, because she's so. She I defines mean, the woman with the head wrap. Yeah, apparently. and there was a lot of like there were a lot of pictures of her, and there's one that was like perfect. And so I hit up Jarrell. I'm like, is this weird that I'm going to, like, I really want to use this picture of Yuna, but, like, is, was she Did you show her? Out? I did, yeah. Yeah. What would she think of it? She likes it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're actually supposed to meet up this week, hopefully. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so, and I, the picture that I used was, like, so perfect. Like, it matched exactly what I was seeing mm-hmm. in she has a very beautiful face. She does, yeah. 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 So yeah, so I ended up using that. But I, I do like to fragment the face so much that it could be anyone. I like to keep the people in my pieces anonymous because I want yeah. to convey more of a mood or emotion than... I like to do that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for doing this. I, I yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know how to give an interview. <laughs> there are people that don't know how to give interviews. Yeah. <laughs>